Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. This morning I'll be preaching from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. And the he that's been spoken of here is Jesus. And this is what it says. It happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from edema. And Jesus responded and said to the lawyers and Pharisees, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent. And he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And they could offer no reply to this. Now he began telling a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, Whenever you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And the one who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then in disgrace you will proceed to occupy the last place. But whenever you are invited, go and take the last place so that when you... The one who has invited you comes, he will say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are dining at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, whenever you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers, your relatives, nor wealthy neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you to a meal in return. That, they will be, that will be your repayment. But whenever you give a banquet, invite people who are poor, who have disabilities, who are limping, and people who are blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Pray with me. Lord, open up these old words that brand new, fresh, you might speak to us today. And by hearing your voice, we might be changed. Thank you for this time. May we never take it for granted. Amen. You know, it's, it's funny over the years, the people that, that you remember and when you remember them. When I was here as associate pastor at this church almost 30 years ago, uh, there was a woman here named Mary Cherry. And Mary and her husband, Sam, they were, they were delightful, older couple. And uh, Mary would often stop by the church to see how she could be helpful. And she was. She was not only helpful, 
she was hilarious to be around. She was just a very, very, very funny person. Well, one day she was in the hall holding court. She was telling a story. She said she and Sam were, dri- were in the car. Sam was driving and they had pulled up to a stoplight. Well, there was a fella in front of them at the stoplight and she and Sam stopped behind the car and they carried on a conversation. Well, Sam's foot came off the the brake pedal, and they they drifted into the car in front of them. She said it was just just barely bumped the car in front of them. And she looked up and noticed that on the bumper of the car in front of them, there was one of those Christian fish. And she said, oh, good. But that's about the time that the door flung open, and this guy got out, said he was just screaming at Sam and came over. Sam's window was down and he began to yell at him, calling him everything but a child of God. And that's when Mary leaned over Sam's lap and said, excuse me, excuse me. I see that fish on your bumper right there. And I see those a lot of places. What does that mean? (laughs) I said, well, what happened? She said, well, he quit yelling at that point, got back in his car, ran the red light and kept going. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I really like those stories where somebody has the right word at the right time. The right word at the right time. Mary Cherry certainly did. And right here, Jesus certainly does. The time. We read it in the very first verse. With The time, it was the Sabbath day. That's important. That's not to be skipped over. We wouldn't have a story if it weren't the Sabbath day. That's the time. And Jesus is meeting with, with, in the house with one of the leaders of the Pharisees. Well, one of the things that we don't get from just reading the words in English, one of the leaders, that this is a specific leader, that he was one of the Sanhedrin. Now, the Sanhedrins weren't just leaders in their community or in their synagogue. These were the 120 men that were sort of the, the high court. These were the ones that were the supreme court for all of Judaism worldwide. There were only 120 of them. This was the highest of the high. And it says that they were watching Jesus closely. Well, they weren't watching to see if he was chewing with his mouth full or his mouth open or if he was using the wrong fork. No, this was the same Sanhedrin that um, sentenced him to death die on the cross. Can you imagine that? Jesus knowing that they were keeping his honor, knowing that they had the power like they did, and still Jesus ate with them. As far as we know, Jesus never turned down an invitation for a meal. And here he is, he's eating with the highest of the high. We know he never turned down an invitation for a meal because he also ate with the lowest of the low. He was condemned for eating with the sinners and the tax gatherers. Seemed like no matter who he ate with, somebody, it was a risk, and somebody was going to call him on it. And that's what happened. Well, here, he's eating with the highest of the high. He looks across the table, and it says that there's a, a man suffering from edema. Now, that's swelling, swelling for, of the joints, usually. And, and it says he was suffering from it. He didn't just just look a little out of place and a little puffy. No, he was suffering from it. Well, there are two things we know about Jesus. One is he never turned down an invitation to dinner, and he never turned down an opportunity to heal. And he he didn't just keep it quiet with his healing, you know, maybe pull his ear or, 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 or wink his eye and poof, the man was healed. No, it says that he took hold of him. And for him to, to, to re- reach across the table or go around the table, it, it, would, have, it would have been a, a, a red flag, a warning to everybody there. And here it's the Sabbath day, and he heals a man. Now, for someone on the Sanhedrin, being a, a, a leader of, the, of the, the Supreme Court, they would know not just that keeping the Sabbath day holy was one of the Ten Commandments, which it is, they they also answered other questions and added laws on top of that. Well, what does it mean to keep the Sabbath day holy? Well, the, the, the 
somebody on the Sanhedrin, they know that it means that you don't work on the Sabbath. Well, what is work? Well, work means that you, you don't pick up anything heavier than a fig. Okay, well, that's a, that's a weight that's involved. Anything heavier than a fig, if you pick it up, it's work. Well, what if your work is that you're a tailor? And, and, and a needle is lighter than a fig. Is that work? Well, somebody write that down. If a tailor carries a needle on the Sabbath day, that's work. Somebody write that down. There were 270 laws for that one commandment, keep the Sabbath day holy. And the leaders of the Sanhedrin knew all 270, not only for that law, but the hundreds and hundreds for all the other Ten Commandments. And keeping an eye on Jesus, as a healer, he would have been breaking the Sabbath to heal on the Sabbath. Even though the, he's not carrying anything heavier than a fig, he's still doing work on the Sabbath. And he's, he's doing it right here in front of a Supreme Court justice. And nobody says anything. But Jesus knows. He knows what's in their hearts. And he says, which one of you who has a son who falls in a well on the Sabbath day? You're not going to call down the well and say, are you heavier than a fig? Well, sorry, I got to beg off for today. No, you go down and you get him. And then he says, which one of you who has an ox that falls in a well on a Sabbath? Do you go down and get him? Well, with a son, you risk being unclean by pulling him out of the, the well on the Sabbath. An ox, it's not you risk soul, you risk body. There are 20 verses in the Old Testament about what to do when an ox gores someone. That you go down into a well to get an ox, the chances are pretty good you're going to be stepped on, you're going to be gored, you're going to be crushed. You, not only your soul, but your body is in danger going down into a well to get an ox. That it's a risk. And Jesus is saying it's an invitation to risk. It's an invitation to risk that, that, that we're not here to, to just play it safe. But they still don't get it. So then Jesus offers a parable, a story to go along with it. Now, Two of the gospel writers, Matthew and Mark, both tell us that Jesus did not teach them anything without a story. Well, why? Well, it's in the story. It's in the story. We get to choose our place. We get to choose and listen to watch in a story. Who do we identify with in this story? Who is it that we're most like? What's our place in the story? So what's the story that he tells? Well, he tells a story about going to a wedding. Imagine you're going to a wedding and you say, Charlene's getting married. Charlene's the same age as your daughter. She's been over to the house, birthday parties, the whole thing. You know her as well as anybody else. Does. You probably know her better than anybody else does. So you go and you think, well, there's seats at the head table. They must be for us. You sit down and that's when Charlene's father comes up and he said, oh, you see over there, that's Aunt Martha and that's Uncle Charlie. Charlene was named after Uncle Charlie. So you don't mind finding another place, do you? And there, Aunt Martha and Uncle Charlie, they come and they sit in your place. And the only place that's left is at the kids' table. Here are these kids throwing food, slurping jello, sitting in tiny chairs. And you've got to go sit in the tiny chairs at the kids' table. And everybody's kind of giggling and snickering that you're having to sit in the tiny chairs. Kids slurping jello. And, and, and it's, it's a big joke for everybody but you. And Jesus says, rather than do that, risk. Go sit at the kids' table. And then when... The father of the bride sees you down there and says, what are you doing at the kids' table? Come on up here. You belong at the head table. Well, that's real cool when it works out that way. But we also, you know, he who doth not toot his own horn doth not get his horn tooted. I, starting off humble, there, chances are real good you're going to stay humble. <laughs> you start off sitting in the tiny chair, the chances are real good you're going to wind up sitting in the tiny chairs, and what Jesus is saying, risk it. 
risk it. This is an invitation to risk. This is an invitation to risk. Think about it. Think about it. Where is Jesus' harshest criticism? Throughout the stories, throughout the gospel, where is Jesus' harshest criticism? It's not for those who say, hey, let's go be bad. No, Jesus' harshest criticism, he doesn't come out. That, that's understood. Just because Jesus doesn't point out those who say, hey, let's go be bad, it doesn't mean that he's condoning it or saying, hey, you, you go be bad because that's fine. No, that his harshest criticism isn't for those who say, let's go be bad. It's for those who choose to do nothing, those who choose not to risk, those who choose to play it safe. Just a couple of chapters before this, Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. And the story of the Good Samaritan isn't, there was somebody who was good, go be good. The story of the Good Samaritan was about a man who fell among robbers and thieves and was beaten and left half dead. Now, Jesus doesn't criticize the robbers and the thieves. It doesn't mean that it's okay to steal and it's okay to beat up people. That's very much part of this life is suffering. Well, this fellow falls among the robbers and thieves. He's beaten up. He's left half dead. The criticism is for the priest who passes by on the other side and chooses to do nothing. The criticism is for the Levite who passes by on the other side and chooses to do nothing. The one who risks, well, that's the Samaritan who chooses to go to the man who's been beaten and robbed. He binds his wounds and he puts him on his own beast. That he's the one who chooses to risk. And a couple of chapters, right, right after chapter 14, is the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Well, the rich man dies and goes to Hades. It's not because he's rich. It's because... Sitting in his driveway was a man named Lazarus who was poor. He, was, he had sores. He was hungry. And the rich man, with all the means to help him, chose to do nothing. He had the means to help. And instead, he, he chose to do nothing. The story that Jesus tells of the landowner who decides to go on a journey. To one of his, his servants, he gives five bags of gold, another three bags of gold, to another one bag of gold. Well, the servant that's called wicked and lazy is the one who chooses to do nothing. He takes his bag of gold and he buries it in the ground. He's called wicked. He's called lazy. The fig tree that Jesus cursed, it wasn't because the fig tree produced bad fruit. It's because it produced no fruit at all. And in the final judgment, Jesus tells a story. When the sheep are separated from the goats, that it's not because the goats have gone out and they've chosen to be bad. They've chosen to, to butt people and bite people and kick people and, and just create a ruckus among people. They've chosen, well... In the words of Jesus, when he was hungry, they did nothing. When he was thirsty, they did nothing. When he was a stranger, they did nothing. When he was naked, they did nothing. When he was sick, they did nothing. When he was in prison, they did nothing. They did nothing. Jesus' harshest criticism was for those who played it safe. Those who did nothing. Those who refused to risk. To love is to risk. To love is to, to reach out across the table. To love is to risk to go down and to the dark place in the well. To risk soul and body. To love is to stick your neck out. And that's what Jesus did for you and for me. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus didn't wait till we were as good as we could be to die on the cross for us. He didn't wait till we were better than we had been. 
that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still running away from him in full flight, that's when Jesus died for you and for me. Not because we were good. It was while we were yet sinners. And that's the way that God demonstrates his love. It's a risk. Not everyone that Jesus died on the cross for said, wow, I never knew a love like this. My life is transformed. No, there are a lot that turn away. That Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. That we might have life. A life that's abundant, a life that's free from guilt, a life that's free from fear, a life that has purpose. And Jesus rose from the grave that you and I might have power, power to risk loving God and loving neighbor. We like the saying, you know, you you get what you give. Well, sometimes you do. But even when you don't, you give anyway. Well, you know, you reap what you sow. Well, sometimes you do, but even when you don't, you sow anyway. At risk. A risk. A risky love is what Jesus' invitation is for you and for me. Max Lucado, in his book, The Angels Were Silent, has a chapter that he calls risky love. And this is what he says. He said, the husband is packing his wife's belongings. His task is solemn. His heart is heavy. He never dreamed that she would die so young. But the cancer came so sure, so quickly. At the bottom of the drawer, he finds a box, a negligee, unworn, still wrapped in paper. She was always waiting for it. A special occasion. He says to himself, always waiting. As the boy on the bicycle watches the students taunt, he turns inside. That's his little brother they're laughing at. He knows he should step in and stand up for his brother, but those are his friends doing the teasing. What will they think? And because it matters what they think, he turns and pedals away. As the husband looks in the jewelry case, He he rationalizes, sure, she would want the watch, but it's too expensive. She's a practical woman. She'll understand. I'll just get the bracelet today. I'll buy the watch someday. Someday. The enemy of risky love is a snake whose tongue has mastered the talk of deception. Someday, he hisses. Someday I can take her on the cruise. Someday I'll have time to call and chat. Someday the children will understand why I was so busy. But you know the truth, don't you? You know even before I write it, you could say it better than I. Someday, some days never come. You and I, we were given power when Jesus rose from the grave. A power not someday, but this day. Power to reach out across the table. Power to go into that dark place, into the well. Power to stick our neck out, not someday, but this day. It's a power that comes from His Holy Spirit. It's the same power that Jesus had as he went to the cross for you and for me to love not just when it's safe not just when it's easy not just when we'll be loved in return a power to love the way that well that he loved us and he loves us still that power is given in a way that we might reach out to others i want to pray with you this morning join with me in prayer Jesus, we are a people that we don't like to risk. We'd much prefer playing it safe. We'd much prefer 
taking the sure route, the easy route, loving only when we're loved in return, only when it it doesn't upset anyone, only when we won't be hurt. Give us power we don't have for a risky love. To the stranger, to the friend, to the neighbor. A risky love that reaches into our heart, to, reaches into our pocket, that reaches across the table and into that dark place. We know that you see in the darkest places, even when others don't. You see, you reach out and you give a strength that we don't have. We ask for that strength now that we might love with a risky love the way you love us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you wanna see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 11.15 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We want to be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear. Serve with commitment. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.